Chapter 1 Before the Revolution In 1754, 21 years before the American Revolution began, an important American called Benjamin Franklin put a picture of the 13 American colonies in his newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette. It showed a snake which was cut into 13 pieces with the words, Join or Die, underneath. Franklin was trying to tell the colonies that they needed to work together in order to survive. At that time, America was not an independent country, and each colony was governed by the mother country, Great Britain. The colonies were happy going their own way, and nobody thought about the need to work together against Britain. But by 1775, everything had changed. The colonies had started to come together like brothers to fight against their mother. Why did the hearts of Americans change so much? How did it happen so fast? This is the story of the American Revolution. In the 1700s, Great Britain was the richest, strongest country in the world. Its land went from India all the way to the Mississippi River in America. In the 1600s, many British people had come to America, calling it the New World. They were looking for a new place to live, and they started colonies up and down the Atlantic coast. Other Europeans, Germans, Dutch, Spanish, and French came later. And by 1750, more than two million people were living in 13 American colonies. Who were these colonists, and why had they come to America? They were brave people. The miserable journey was the first of many dangers and difficulties for them. Almost 5,000 kilometers of water lay between Europe and the New World, and the journey by sailing ship took seven weeks with a good wind, but often it took much longer. What was it like to travel to America in those days? We're lucky to have a diary that was written by a young German colonist, Gottlieb Mittelberger. He sailed to America in 1750, and in his diary, he describes the frightening journey. Like other passengers on the ship, he was always hungry and thirsty. The water on the ship, he wrote, is often black. The ship that Middleburger traveled on was crowded, and he had to sleep on the floor, lying next to other passengers in narrow rows. With so many people on the ship, disease moved quickly from one person to the next. Thirty-two children died, and their bodies were thrown into the sea. Things became even worse during storms, which could go on for two or three days. The waves rise like high mountains, one above the other, and often fall over the ship. No one can walk or sit or lie. Crying passengers fell over each other, breaking arms and legs. Some fell into the stormy sea. When at last the ship reached land, Middleburger and the other passengers, half alive, cried with happiness to see America. But when people arrived in the new world, new difficulties often began. There was the strangeness of daily life in a new land, and the terrible winters. America was a wild land, too, with Indians who could be unfriendly and new diseases that could kill you. In many families, children often died of different illnesses. Why then did these colonists come to this unknown land? Because although life in 1750s America was more dangerous than in Europe, it was full of opportunity.
colonists had a lot to lose, but also a lot to win. America was a wonderful place for poor Europeans to get land. There were kilometers of rich, wild land in America, and it was cheap. In America, you could arrive poor, but if you worked hard, you lived well. It is here that the poor become rich, wrote a famous French colonist. That did not often happen in Europe. Benjamin Franklin's life is a good example of the opportunities that people could find in America in the 1700s. Franklin was born in Boston in 1706. He was the son of a simple candlemaker from England and one of 17 children. But he became one of the most famous men in the world. When he was just 10 years old, he had to leave school in order to work, but he continued studying on his own and read every book he could find. Franklin left his family and moved to Philadelphia at the age of 17. He arrived there without a job or money, but by the time he was 23, he was a successful businessman and owned the Pennsylvania Gazette an important newspaper. Franklin often wrote in the newspaper, and it was read all over the colonies. He also worked hard to make the city of Philadelphia a better place to live in. For example, in 1731, he helped to begin a library so that more people could read books. Later, he became an important leader of the American Revolution. Because land was not expensive, most colonists became farmers. They were able to own the land that they worked on, something that had been impossible in Europe, because all the farms there belonged to a few rich men. With the help of neighbors, colonists cleared the land, cutting down thick forests and carrying away rocks to make rich fields where they planted vegetables, fruit, tobacco, and rice. But as the colonies grew and more forests were destroyed, the American Indians in the East lost their homes and had to move further and further west. America was not a land of opportunity for the Indians as it was for the colonists. And we must not forget that there were other people in America at the time who had no opportunities at all. These were the slaves who had come by ship from Africa. Their long journey was much worse than Gottlieb Middleburger's. By 1750, one out of every five colonists was a slave. They worked in the southern colonies on large farms that grew tobacco or rice. The slaves, many of them children, worked long days under the hot sun, and their lives were full of hopelessness. American farmers had to work hard in order to survive. They built their own houses, usually with two rooms downstairs and two rooms upstairs, and a big warm fire in the kitchen. The men planted vegetables, fished, and cut down trees to make wood for the fire. The women washed, cooked, took care of the garden, and made their own clothes. Then they made butter, candles, and blankets. The children picked fruit carried water from the river, helped in the kitchen, and took care of the family's horse, cows, and chickens. School was important in the colonies, so children studied too. There was never time to rest. Before the American Revolution, most colonists never traveled more than 50 kilometers from home. 
and travel was slow in those days. The best roads in 1750 were made of stones, but there were only a few of those. When it rained or snowed, most roads were useless. The journey from Boston to Philadelphia, which takes six hours by car today, took two weeks in 1750. Philadelphia was the biggest and finest town in America in those days. It had tall houses and wide, straight streets full of people and horses. There were booksellers, candle makers, shoemakers, and shops that made fine silver plates. But next to the great European cities of London and Paris, it was a simple, unfashionable town. People tied their cows behind their houses, and they washed themselves outside. They still looked to England for books, clothes, and ideas. Although the American colonists were still loyal to Britain, and to Britain's King George III, the New World was a different place from Britain. The colonists' fight for survival in a new land had given them new ways of doing things and new ways of thinking. They had started to think about being independent. Chapter 2. Unfair Taxes I love Americans, said Britain's Prime Minister, William Pitt. But we are the mother country, they are the children, and they must obey. But after 1763, the American colonists no longer wanted to listen to their mother. In 1763, the Americans had just finished the French and Indian War, a fight between Britain and France over Indian land next to the colonies. Britain had successfully chased France out of North America. The war had been very expensive, and Britain's pockets were empty. As well as the war, Britain also had to pay for the high cost of keeping almost 10,000 British soldiers in the colonies to make them safe from unfriendly Indians. The king's army needed clothes, food, and somewhere to live. Where was the money to pay for everything? And who should pay? British citizens were already paying very high taxes. 25 times higher than the taxes that colonists paid in America. So Britain decided that the colonists should help pay for the costs. The colonists did not agree. Almost 25,000 of them had fought in the war, too. We helped Britain to win the war, they argued. We don't need the British Army here anymore and we don't want to pay for it. But from 1763 to 1775, King George tried again and again to get money from the American colonies. Each time the colonists grew angrier. They didn't think that Britain had the right to put its hands into their pockets. First, Britain ordered the colonists to pay for rooms, houses, or hotels for British soldiers, and to pay for the soldiers' blankets, food, beer, and firewood. Some colonies obeyed these laws. Others refused. Then the British introduced new trade laws. The colonists had to buy almost everything they needed from Britain, although it was often more expensive. They had to sell their coffee, tobacco, and sugar to the British, too. The colonists knew that they could get better prices if they sold to other countries, and these laws made them angry. 
So the Americans filled large ships with coffee, sugar, and tobacco, and sailed out of their harbors secretly in the dark of the night. But it didn't take the British long to find out what was happening. They sent ships to catch the criminals and put them in prison. Colonists wrote angry letters to King George, but he didn't write back and probably didn't even read their letters. Instead, in 1765, the king made things worse by introducing the stamp tax. The colonists now had to buy a British stamp for every kind of paper they used. Newspapers, small books, and even playing cards had stamp tax on them. Although the stamp tax was accepted in Britain, the colonists didn't want it in America. It's unfair. It's unfair. They shouted in streets, shops, and town meetings. The colonists did not mind paying taxes to their own governments, but they had no representatives in the British government. The British, thought the colonists, have the right to decide through their representatives how much tax to pay. Why shouldn't we have this same right? The colonists were strong, determined people who had sailed dangerous seas and cleared wild forests looking for a better life. They didn't want Britain to tell them what to do. Soon, the colonies exploded in an angry storm. People became violent, throwing rocks and starting fires in the street. They broke the windows of British and American stamp sellers and destroyed their homes. A secret group of men, called the Sons of Liberty, caught some of the stamp sellers, brushed hot black tar all over their skin, and then covered the tar with chicken feathers. It was a terrible thing to do. The tar burned the skin, and the feathers were almost impossible to pull off without pulling off big pieces of skin at the same time. The colonists' violent refusal to pay the stamp tax surprised the British. They saw Americans as hotheads, fiery people who were always unhappy and looking for a fight. Some Americans, like Benjamin Franklin, were also surprised by the strong feelings against the British government. Franklin had worked in England for a number of years and had many friends there. But now, he realized that he had to fight for better rights for the American people. A year later, in 1766, King George finally stopped the stamp tax. But in 1767, a new tax appeared on glass, paper, and tea. Crowds once again filled the streets and meeting houses, shouting even louder. The king sent more and more British soldiers to the colonies to watch the angry colonists. The British soldiers were excellent fighters, but they had a miserable life. They were unwelcome in America. Their pay was low, and they had a dangerous job. They were beaten for the smallest mistakes, if their uniforms were dirty, or if their boots were not shiny. The soldiers, who were called redcoats because of their red jackets, began to hate life in America, and the colonists hated the redcoats. A fight between British soldiers and American citizens exploded one winter evening in 1770 in Boston, the second largest city in the colonies. The city was snowy and cold. A crowd of schoolboys began shouting and throwing hard balls of snow at a small band of redcoats. The crowd grew bigger and bigger, and many men now joined it. The redcoats tried to calm the crowd down,
while rocks flew through the air, hitting British arms, legs, and heads. Then, bang, there was a shot. A frightened redcoat had shot his gun by accident. A wall of people ran towards the redcoats, who now lifted their guns straight at the crowd. Five colonists were shot and killed. Among them was a man who was called Crispus Attucks, an escaped slave. Later, people remembered him as the first black man to die in the American Revolution. Boston never forgot that bloody night. The next day, newspapers reported the news all over the colonies, and the king moved his soldiers out of Boston to the safety of Fort William on an island near Boston Harbor. Chapter 3 The Boston Tea Party On December 16, 1773, three grand British ships with tall white sails waited in the cold water of Boston Harbor. Everything looked calm and peaceful, but not for long. Trouble was coming. The people of Boston were angry about the British tea that filled the ships. They didn't like the new British tea tax. And Britain said that British tea was the only kind of tea that American colonists could buy. These trade laws didn't seem fair. Although they loved British tea, Americans refused to drink it. Some of them tried to make their own tea from wild plants. That night in Boston, there was a noisy town meeting with thousands of colonists. These taxes are unfair. Send the tea back to Britain, they shouted. The king's representative in Boston refused to listen to them. These ships will not leave Boston until they're empty, he said. Then Samuel Adams stood up. He was a troublemaker and one of the leaders of the Sons of Liberty, together with John Hancock. This meeting can do nothing more to save the country, shouted Samuel Adams angrily to the crowd. Later that night, Samuel Adams, John Hancock, and about a hundred Sons of Liberty did something unforgettable and a little crazy to show how much they hated King George's new trade laws and taxes. They dressed as Mohawk Indians, blackening their faces and putting feathers in their hats. Then they picked up axes and marched two by two towards Boston Harbor. The moon was bright in the night sky. The men took small boats out to the British ships when they boarded the ships, no one tried to stop them. With their axes, the Indians destroyed 342 boxes of valuable British tea and threw everything into the black water of the harbor. Three hours later, the men left the ships and disappeared quietly into the night. The next morning, when the sun came up, the people of Boston saw tea leaves all over their beaches and broken tea boxes in their harbor. They called it a party, the Boston Tea Party. Many colonists were pleased. They sang this song in the bars of Boston. Mohawks, bring out your axes and tell King George will pay no taxes. When he heard the news, Benjamin Franklin was ashamed. He called the Boston Tea Party violent and unfair, and he argued that Boston should pay Britain for the damage. When the news finally reached King George, he exploded. Things had gone too far. Close Boston Harbor, 
he ordered. Until the colonists pay for the lost tea. The king wanted to punish the colonists and to teach Boston a lesson. He thought that the colonies were like a dangerous snake, with Boston as its head. The whole snake will die if I cut off its head, he said to himself. It was a mistake for the king to close Boston Harbor. But to make things worse, he also sent British soldiers back into Boston. The crowds of redcoats who now filled the streets of Boston frightened the colonists and made them feel like second-class citizens. And because no ships could enter or leave Boston Harbor, people could not trade or fish. Will we have enough food to eat? They worried. Boston wanted the other twelve colonies to know what was happening. Riders on fast horses hurried out of the city with letters in their bags asking for help. When the other colonies heard the news, they were angry too. Will we be next? Will the king punish us too? They wondered. If the king took away Boston's rights, then no colony was safe. So they decided to help Boston. New York sent sheep. South Carolina sent rice. Maryland sent bread. Money came from Connecticut and Delaware. If you attack Boston, you attack all 13 colonies, they said. The colonies were standing together, which surprised King George and everyone in Britain. Before this, the colonies had never been able to agree with each other. They had argued and fought about everything. New Jersey didn't like New York. The northern colonies didn't like the southern ones. But now, they were like one big family, uniting around Boston's troubles. It was extraordinary. The United Colonists wanted to tell the king how they felt. So, in September 1774, all the colonies except Georgia sent their leaders to a meeting in Philadelphia. Most of the men had never met before. They were teachers, lawyers, farmers, business people, and doctors. They called themselves the First Congress. What are we going to do next? They asked each other. They were very worried. They knew that they had to do something. They could not just let King George order them around. But still, most of them wanted peace with Britain. The idea of a bloody war frightened them. The First Congress spent seven weeks together. They discussed the colony's problems and made a list of their rights. Then they wrote a polite letter to the king that explained exactly what they wanted. Let us be as free as yourselves, they wrote. The First Congress also decided to stop all trade with Britain. The colonists shouldn't buy or even use anything that came from Britain. No more fine, fashionable British clothes. No more lovely British candles. And, of course, no more tea. Congress asked Americans to live simply and to make things for themselves. At the end of the meeting, the men were satisfied with their work. They felt that they had left the door open for peace with Britain. But something was different. The colonists were beginning to change. They were becoming Americans. At the end of the First Congress, in October 1774, the leaders sent off their letter to the king, and they decided to meet again if things became worse. And indeed, they did. The first battle of the American Revolution was just around the corner.
Chapter 4 The Shot That Was Heard Around the World In October 1774, in London, King George decided not to read the letter that the First Congress had written. The king wanted to show the world that the mother country could control her troublemaking children. This just made the colonists angrier. War was in the air. General Gage, who was the commander-in-chief of the British Army in America, still wanted peace. In fact, he liked Americans. He had lived and worked with the army in the colonies for 18 years, and he had an American wife. He was sure that he could calm things down. But the American rebels were becoming braver. One year after the Boston Tea Party, General Gage became worried. He had only 1,500 British soldiers. Send more soldiers, he wrote to King George in December 1774. The colonists were busy preparing for war. They were secretly collecting medicine and weapons and hiding them in buildings in Concord and Lexington, small towns near Boston. Farmers were also hiding guns and axes on their farms. They put them in the middle of their fields, under dried grass, or they dug deep holes to put them in, and covered everything with leaves. Spies informed General Gage about these secret weapons. Gage also learned that two leaders of the Boston Tea Party, Samuel Adams and John Hancock, were hiding in a house in Lexington. The king had ordered Gage to arrest these two men and send them to London as soon as possible. Gage planned to attack. After I find the weapons and arrest the two rebel leaders, he thought, things will calm down. He was sure that he could succeed and do it peacefully. The rebels were just simple farmers, after all. They couldn't possibly give the great British army any real trouble. On April 19, 1775, General Gage sent about 800 redcoats from Boston across the Charles River in boats. From there, wet and cold, the King's army began to march down the dark road to Lexington, about 32 kilometers away, to find the weapons and the two rebel leaders. The Americans were waiting for them in the town square. They had found out about the attack. They had spies, too. A rebel, Paul Revere, had carried the message across the Charles River just before the British. Then he had jumped on a horse and had hurried down the road to Lexington. The redcoats are coming! He warned every farmhouse along the way. Church bells began ringing, telling Minutemen everywhere to get their guns ready. The Minutemen were a group of American farmers, teachers, and traders who were ready to fight the British in a very short time, a minute. In Lexington, Revere rode straight to the house where his friends, Samuel Adams and John Hancock, were staying. Save yourselves, he cried, and both men made a successful escape just before the Redcoats arrived. When the 800 British soldiers arrived in Lexington in the early morning, about 70 American Minutemen stood ready to fight them. There were teenagers, fathers and grandfathers, who held guns, axes, and other weapons. They wore old farm clothes and did not look anything like an army. Both sides were worried. Put down your weapons, you rebels, or you are all dead men, cried a British officer. Suddenly, there was a shot. Did it come from a rebel? Or did it come from a redcoat? Was it an accident? To this day, no one is sure. But the shot started a war. Today, people call it the shot that was heard around the world.
because it changed America's place in the world. Now the British soldiers fired their guns at the rebels. The rebels fired back. When the smoke cleared, eight Americans were dead and ten were bleeding. The rest ran away. No British soldiers were wounded. The Redcoats then marched on towards Concord, ten kilometers away, where they searched every house for hidden weapons. By this time, about 400 Minutemen had arrived in Concord. They lay in the hills above the town and silently watched what was happening below them. Suddenly, they saw a cloud of black smoke. The Redcoats are burning our town, they cried. This was not true. The British soldiers had simply made a big fire in the street to burn the weapons that they had found in people's homes. But the Minutemen were running down the hills towards the British soldiers. Stop! a British officer shouted. But the Americans continued to come towards them. The Redcoats fired. One American was shot in the head, another through the heart. When the Americans fired back, twelve British soldiers fell to the ground. Three were dead, and nine were wounded. Now the Redcoats began to run for their lives. The Minutemen went back to the hills. Only one rebel farmer stayed in town. He took his axe and killed a wounded Redcoat with it. British soldiers found the dead soldier with the axe in his head later that day. Tired and frightened, they began to march back to Boston. They thought that their troubles were finished. But suddenly, out of nowhere, bullets began to fly through the air. Behind every tree and every rock, there were Minutemen with guns. One after another, British bodies fell to the ground, bleeding, crying, and dying. The battle continued almost all the way to Boston. Many Americans were killed on this awful afternoon, but many more British soldiers died. The simple farmers had chased the great British army all the way back to Boston. General Gage began to look at the rebels with new eyes. Worried by the battles of Lexington and Concord, the colonists sent their leaders to another meeting in Philadelphia in May 1775. This was the beginning of the Second Congress, a meeting that went on for several years. Let's try once more to make peace with Britain, some of the men argued. So they sent the king one last letter, known as the Olive Branch Letter, because they hoped that it would bring peace between Britain and America. But after these first battles, Americans realized that they needed a real army. The Second Congress voted to make George Washington the commander-in-chief. Washington was a rich 43-year-old farmer from Virginia who had been an officer with the British Army in the French and Indian War. His adventures during that war had made him famous. A strong and good-looking man, Washington was tall and as straight as a tree, and everyone looked at him when he entered a room. But he was a quiet man and not very talkative, perhaps because he had very bad teeth. Everyone liked him. Although he did not think he was the best man for this difficult job, Washington agreed to accept it. He refused to be paid for this work. He only took the job, he said, because it was the right thing to do. Chapter 5 The Fight for Boston The British were now back in Boston. The Minutemen had chased them all the way there. 
The British controlled Boston, but the American rebels did not want them in any other towns. So they surrounded Boston and cut off all the roads that went in and out of the city. The British could not leave, except by ship. Officers from both sides met and agreed that colonists who did not want to stay in Boston with the British soldiers could leave the city immediately. Colonists from outside Boston who wanted to join the British could enter the city. The roads were full of people who were moving both ways. Colonists who entered Boston were called Loyalists because they were loyal to Britain's King George. During the war, many Americans stayed loyal to the king. Sometimes the war destroyed families. Brother didn't agree with brother. Parents fought with children. Benjamin Franklin, for example, was a rebel, and his son William was a loyalist. The two had been very close, but during the American War of Independence, they argued, and then never spoke again for the rest of their lives. By June 1775, news of the battles at Lexington and Concord had traveled to all thirteen colonies. The British fired first, riders on horses cried, although no one knew this for sure. Angry Sons of Liberty broke into the homes of Loyalists and covered them with tar and feathers. In big and small towns, church bells rang to tell colonists that it was time to pick up their weapons and fight the British. American farmers, shoemakers, and traders put down their work and hurried to answer the call. A new American army was growing, and most of it was around Boston. Soon, the British in Boston found thousands and thousands of American rebel soldiers in a big circle around them. They were prisoners in the city. One morning in June, when the British redcoats woke up, they found a surprise waiting for them. The night before, Bunker Hill, a small hill above Boston, had been empty. Now, a large new fort stood on top of it. Guns and cannons were looking down at the British, ready to shoot straight in their faces. American soldiers had worked secretly through the night to build the fort. The rebels have done more in a night than my army could do in months, said Britain's commander-in-chief. He was worried, and he knew that he had to attack the fort as soon as possible. That afternoon, the British soldiers started to climb the hill. They did not know that the American officers had ordered their men not to fire their guns until the enemy was close, close enough to see the whites of their eyes. The rebels had very few bullets, so every shot was important. Step by step, the redcoats marched up towards the fort. To their surprise, no shots were fired. But when they were very close to the fort, a deadly rain of bullets hit them all at once. The Americans had all fired at the same time. Hundreds of redcoats fell dead in the thick white smoke. The others turned and ran back downhill. British officers ordered their men to attack a second time. The same thing happened again. When the brave redcoats marched up the hill the third time, the Americans had no bullets left, and they had to run. The British took the fort, but at a terrible cost. One thousand British soldiers had been killed that day. Back in Britain, People were angry and worried by the terrible news. The Battle of Bunker Hill made them realize that this war was not as quick and simple as they had thought. General Gage lost his job as commander-in-chief, and General Howe was put in his place.
In July 1775, George Washington arrived in Boston from his farm in Virginia. He was the new commander-in-chief of the growing army of rebels who now surrounded Boston. I will return safe to you in the autumn, he promised in a letter to his wife, Martha. But it was a promise he could not keep. The war went on far longer than Washington had thought possible. He was away from home for the next six years. When Washington first met his new army of 16,000 men, he was surprised at what he saw. They are dirty and nasty people, he wrote in a letter to a friend. There was no order among the soldiers. They fought with each other. Many were dressed like farmers. Others were wearing the red coats of the British. They were sleeping in tents made of dirty old blankets. They had few weapons and little food or medicine. Washington, who was a strong but lovable leader, began the hard job of making these men into a working army. The Congress back in Philadelphia gave him very little money, so he was always short of food, bullets, and guns and his army wasn't as ready to fight as it could be. But the British didn't know this. As autumn became winter and snow began to fall, the American soldiers continued to surround Boston. While the British officers lived comfortably inside their prison, life for the Redcoat soldiers was awful. They were bored, hungry, and often very sick. The American soldiers outside Boston began to worry, too. How will we stay warm this winter? They wondered. Where will we find enough wood for our fires? By the end of December 1775, they had cut down and burned every tree around Boston. While most of the men stayed in their tents and shook with cold, Washington ordered others to go to villages further and further away in order to find wood. The men were patient because they had heard that help was on the way. Big cannons were on their way, and they wanted to show the British a good fight and take Boston back. In fact, a bookseller named Henry Knox was planning to bring the cannons to George Washington in Boston. Knox, who knew all about cannons after he had spent years reading about them, was now one of Washington's officers. He had a plan to move 59 cannons 500 kilometers to Boston. His plan seemed crazy, difficult, and dangerous, but it worked. Knox put the heavy cannons on sleds that were pulled across country by horses, men, and oxen. There were few roads in America then. Pushing and pulling, they moved the cannons through snowy forests and up and down icy hills. Many times the tired animals and men stopped and refused to go on. But each time, Knox, a very large man and a good leader, persuaded them to continue. When they reached the Hudson River, the weather had become warmer, and the ice on the river was thin and weak. Knox decided to take a dangerous chance and cross the river on the ice. His men were worried. As the animals pulled the heavy cannons across the river, the ice made a deep noise. Surprisingly, only one cannon broke through the ice and fell into the water. At the end of January 1776, Knox finally brought the cannons to his commander-in-chief, Washington, in Boston. Washington's serious face broke into a big, happy smile when he saw them. Knox had done it. One night, in early March, fog covered the city of Boston but a full moon lit the hills around it. Washington and his men moved the cannons to the hills above Boston. 
and pointed them straight at the heart of the city. Once again, the British in Boston woke up to an unpleasant surprise. Washington was now ready for the British to attack. In fact, he wanted them to fight. He was sure that he could destroy the British army and end the war quickly. If only he could get the British to come out of Boston. But General Howe did not attack. Why not? Perhaps because he remembered the terrible killings at Bunker Hill. Or perhaps his men were too hungry to fight. Instead, he put his soldiers and 1,000 American loyalists on grand British ships and sailed out of Boston Harbor towards the safety of Canada. Washington had chased the strongest army in the world out of Boston and out of the colonies. They'll be back, he thought as he watched them leave. It's not finished. Chapter 6. The Declaration of Independence Back in London, King George was given the Olive Branch letter from the American Congress, but did not reply to it. In fact, he did not even read it. So when the Congress met again in Philadelphia in late 1775, there was a lot of talk about independence. We must break with Britain immediately, some leaders argued. And the sooner the better. But not everyone was comfortable with this idea. Many serious-thinking men were fearful. They thought that it was too dangerous to break with Mother England. Others worried that it was just too soon to decide. Still others argued for change, but a peaceful change. For many months, the men of the Congress sat in their hard wooden seats and discussed the future of America. As time passed, more and more colonies agreed that America should be an independent country. By the spring of 1776, the Congress was calling the colonies states. In June 1776, the men of the Congress decided to write a Declaration of Independence that explained why America must be free. Who should write it? They wondered. Everyone turned to Thomas Jefferson, a young lawyer and future president of America. At 33, Jefferson was one of the youngest men of the Congress and very quiet. But everyone knew that he was intelligent full of ideas, and most importantly, the best writer of the group. Jefferson didn't think that he was the best person for this very important job, but finally he was persuaded to do it. That night, he climbed the steps to his room and sat down at his desk. He picked up his pen and stared at the white page. He had the difficult, lonely job of trying to explain America's need for independence to the whole world. Jefferson worked late into the night. Every day, Jefferson got up before the sun came up. He had breakfast and then started work. Carefully, he wrote a few words, then stopped, changed the words, and started again. He finished a page and then threw it away. He wanted every word to be perfect. Finally, he put his most famous words onto the page. All men are created equal. It took him over two weeks to finish the Declaration of Independence. On July 1st, 1776, the Congress was still discussing the future of America. It was a hot summer day, and the air was heavy and wet.
a man from Pennsylvania stood up to argue against independence. It was a mistake, he cried, to take the colonies away from the mother country at this time. It's like destroying our house in winter before we have found another house to live in, he went on. Slowly, a well-known man named John Adams, a leader of the revolution, and another future president of America, stood up to reply. As Adams spoke, the sky became dark. Wild winds and heavy rains shook the tall windows of the room. Adams' voice shook, too. It was as powerful as the storm, and his words were as hot as fire. He explained all the reasons for breaking with Britain. He talked and talked. When John Adams finished speaking, it was late afternoon. The men of Congress sat and said nothing. Their hearts were beating hard. Everything now seemed clear. Jefferson said later, Adams had moved us from our seats. When it was time to vote, almost every leader agreed. Adams had persuaded them that there was only one road for America, and that was the dangerous and bloody road to independence. Three days later, July 4, 1776, was one of the most important days in American history. It was another hot, still day. Clouds of flies flew in noisy circles around the room where the Congress was meeting to discuss Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. The men changed some of Jefferson's words and then agreed to accept it. John Hancock, President of the Congress, signed the Declaration first. He picked up the pen and bravely wrote his name in big letters. That way, he said, the King of England can read it without his glasses. All the men knew how dangerous it was to sign the paper. If Britain caught them, they could be killed as criminals. Years later, one of the leaders of the Congress wrote that he could never forget his fears and sleepless nights in the days and weeks after July 4, 1776. Jefferson later said that he did not really write anything new in the Declaration of Independence. He was only trying to explain the American way of thinking. The Declaration has become one of the most important papers ever written. Some of its important ideas are these. Everyone is born with the same rights. Everyone has a right to life, freedom, and happiness. If the government fails to give a citizen these rights, the people can make a new government. These ideas of equality, freedom, and the right to happiness are still important things for Americans today and they continue to hold the many different people in the country together. The Declaration of Independence helped to keep the American Revolution alive. Fast riders carried the Declaration to towns and villages all over the 13 states. Excitement was in the air. Colonists rang bells, lit fires, fired their guns, and burned pictures of King George. The Declaration was read aloud in town squares all over the colonies, where happy crowds laughed and cried as they listened. It was read to George Washington and his soldiers in New York City on July 9th. That same night, the Sons of Liberty pulled down the large statue of King George in the middle of New York City. The metal from the statue was later used to make thousands of bullets for American guns. Americans were not colonists anymore. The Declaration of Independence said that they were now citizens of the United States of America. But now, they had to fight for their independence. John Adams knew this 
After he signed the declaration, he wrote to his wife Abigail, I know the blood that it will cost us to keep this declaration. Chapter 7 Fighting for Independence On March 4, 1776, the British had sailed out of Boston Harbor. But only four months later, while the American colonists were still celebrating the Declaration of Independence, the British came back. This time, hundreds of British warships sailed into New York Harbor. Day after day, more British ships arrived. They carried soldiers, cannons, and heavy guns. There were about 23,000 well-rested redcoats and 8,000 German soldiers who were paid to help the British. Britain's army was the best in the world, and this was the largest army that they had ever sent across the sea. General Howe was getting ready to attack New York City. The arrival of the British was no surprise. George Washington had moved his army to New York and was waiting for them. The Americans watched the enemy from behind the walls of the forts that they had put up around the city. The American men had worked day and night in the summer heat for three months to build more than twenty forts. They had carried stones, dug holes, and moved large cannons into the forts. Washington knew that this heavy work had made his men tired and weak. But it was important for Washington to keep New York City, a rich, busy town of 25,000 people. With its good harbor, New York was an important center for trade and business. Washington also knew that if the British took New York, they could move up New York's rivers, go deep into the colonies, and attack Philadelphia, the home of the American Congress. And the British could win the war. Washington knew that the British army was strong, while his own army had never been in battle before. He had no warships. His army was far smaller than the British army. A British officer later described it as the strangest army, with old men of sixty and boys of fourteen in it. The soldiers didn't have uniforms, and some didn't even have guns, and they were weak from their hard work on the forts. In August 1776, the British ships fired their guns onto Long Island. The battle for New York had begun. As the British started marching, families from farms on Long Island put their furniture into wagons and hurried away. The redcoats moved quickly through Long Island. They burned houses, farms, and potato fields, and destroyed everything in their way. In just one day, more than 1,000 American men were killed or wounded. A foot soldier in Washington's army, Joseph Martin, kept a war diary that tells us a lot about daily life for an American soldier during the Revolution. Martin was just 16 years old during the 1776 Battle of New York. We began to meet the wounded men, he writes some with broken arms, some with broken legs, some with broken heads. Washington, too, was saddened by what he saw during the battle. I feel angry, he said, and sick and sorry. The British had attacked from three sides, and they were now surrounding Washington's men. The East River, which separates Long Island from Manhattan Island, was behind the Americans. Washington knew that his soldiers were in danger. We have to escape now, or we will have no men left, he thought. Luckily for Washington, the weather suddenly became bad 
a thick fog covered Long Island. Washington found every unused boat in the city. And at night, in the dark, he ordered his 9,000 soldiers to take the small boats across the East River to Manhattan. Silence, Washington told his men as they pulled up their tents and marched down to the river with their weapons. Don't talk or even whisper. A lucky wind blew the boats safely across the river while the British slept. When they woke up the next morning, they had quite a surprise. The American army had disappeared from Long Island. They had managed to survive for another day. Some historians say that General Howe was still more interested in peace than war at this moment, and that was why his large ships did not attack the little boats in the river. In fact, Howe moved very slowly during the next weeks. He even invited two men who had signed the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Franklin and John Adams, to peace talks in mid-September. But the two sides could agree on nothing. So the war continued. The British soon chased Washington off the island of Manhattan. In some battles, when the American soldiers at the front were fired upon, they didn't even fire a shot back. They threw their guns down, began to run, and often fell over each other in their hurry to get away. The soldiers behind saw the soldiers in front running and followed. Soon, all of the American army was running away. Washington rode into battle on his large white horse, shouting at his men and hitting them with the flat side of his sword to stop them running away. Good God, do I have soldiers like these, Washington cried. He knew that he was in trouble. The weather became colder, and the American soldiers found survival difficult. Joseph Martin writes that he had to sleep almost every other night on the cold and often wet ground, without a blanket, and in nothing but thin summer clothes. Later, the boy became sick. He had only the sky as his hospital, and dry leaves for his bed. I had nothing to eat or drink, Martin continues, not even water, and was unable to go and find any for myself, because I was so sick. We must not forget the women who traveled with the American army and worked in the camps as cooks and nurses. A few women, dressed as men, even became soldiers. One young farm girl, Deborah Sampson, marched and fought as a soldier until she became very sick and a doctor discovered her secret. Things got worse and worse for the American army as autumn became winter. New York was now in British hands and became the new British capital. The King's army chased the Americans south through New Jersey and all the way across the Delaware River into Pennsylvania, where Washington made his camp. By then, Washington had only 3,000 men left, and they were very tired. The rest of them had died in battle, died from disease, or had simply gone home. Washington had almost no hope left. Although he went on asking for more soldiers, Congress did not send them to him. Because the American rebels had won easy battles in Lexington and Boston, Congress got the wrong idea that the British Army was weak and that Washington didn't really need a lot of help. The British had decided to stop fighting during the cold winter, and most of their soldiers had returned to New York. Only about 1,000 German soldiers were left in a camp in Trenton, New Jersey, about 20 kilometers from Washington's camp across the Delaware River. Just when it seemed that all hope was lost for the American side, 
Washington thought of a clever plan. On December 24th, he heard from his spies that the Germans across the river were celebrating Christmas at their camp, drinking beer, eating, singing, and dancing. Now is the time to surprise them, thought Washington. The Germans knew that the American army was broken, so they weren't worried. Because it was Christmas, they became careless. The German commander-in-chief, Johann Rahl, had let his men put their guns away. As night fell, Washington and his soldiers got into boats on the Delaware River. The bookseller Henry Knox was there, too, lifting heavy cannons, guns, and horses onto flat boats. As the army crossed the river into New Jersey, a sharp wind blew snow and ice in their faces. The boats had trouble moving through the thick, icy waters, and the trip took a long time. Blue with cold, the men reached the New Jersey side of the Delaware River, where the weather got worse. I have never seen Washington as determined as he is now, wrote one of his officers. He is calm, but very determined. The Americans still had to march 14 kilometers to reach the German camp before morning. The snow was getting deeper and deeper. It is fearfully cold, and a snowstorm is coming. The wind beats in the faces of the men, wrote the officer. It will be a terrible night for the soldiers who have no shoes. Some of them have tied old rags around their feet. Others are barefoot. But I have not heard a man complain. Washington rode up and down among his men, moving them forwards with his words. Go on, my brave men, he whispered to the marching soldiers. The snow under their feet was red with blood. While the Americans marched through the snowy forest, a loyalist spy ran to warn the German commander-in-chief in Trenton about the surprise attack. But Johann Rahl, who was drinking and playing cards, refused to see him. The Loyalist then wrote a message, which Rawl just put into his pocket without reading. Although snow makes walking difficult, it also makes everything quiet. The Germans didn't hear the American soldiers, their horses, or their heavy cannons coming until it was too late. At eight o'clock in the morning on December 26th, the Americans marched into the German camp and began shooting. Still sleepy and drunk from their Christmas party the night before, the Germans did not know what was happening. Rahl ordered his men to find their weapons, but it was too late. They were surrounded. Rahl was hit by a bullet, fell from his horse, and died. Washington's men had won a battle at last. They took 1,000 prisoners that day. The great news of the Battle of Trenton traveled quickly through the colonies. The Americans had badly needed this success. It gave new hope to the colonies and new life to their revolution. Chapter 8. A Long, Hard Winter Washington's Christmas victory at Trenton had saved the American Revolution. With the arrival of spring, Washington felt new hope. His men were now well-rested, and thousands of new soldiers had decided to join his army. France was beginning to offer help, too. Benjamin Franklin had sailed to Paris in late 1776 to ask the French to enter the war on the American side. France and Britain were, of course, very old enemies. 
Although the French were not ready to send an army to the colonies, they secretly sent supplies to Washington's army. The first French ship, the Mercury, landed south of Boston in March 1777, full of food, clothes, and guns. More than 30 other French ships followed the Mercury that spring. General Howe was in no hurry to continue the fight. He was having a good time in New York City, going to one party after another, drinking and dancing with rich American loyalists. But finally, in the summer of 1777, Howe made a move. He put his soldiers and their horses into ships, and they sailed south from New York Harbor. Howe was taking them to Philadelphia. He wanted to take control of this important city. He knew that he badly needed a big victory. And what better victory than to take the largest and most important city in the colonies for Britain? Philadelphia was also the rebel capital, the home of the American Congress, and the place where the Declaration of Independence had been signed the center of trouble for the British. If we win Philadelphia, Howe thought, it will kill the rebels' hopes and put an end to this war. In July 1777, Washington moved his army too, to get ready for the next battle. But first, he marched 16,000 men through the sunny streets of Philadelphia. Crowds of colonists and all the leaders from the Congress were there to watch them pass. Washington, one of the best riders of his day, rode at the head of the army, sitting straight as a statue on his beautiful white horse. He was unsmiling and determined-looking. There were deep shadows under his eyes. The commander-in-chief's face was older now and showed the hard times and the pain that he and his army had lived through. Washington's men still didn't look quite like soldiers. Many had no uniforms, and were dressed in brown clothes with green leaves on their hats. They can't really march in time, said John Adams, the congressman who had argued so strongly for independence. And they don't hold up their heads. But he looked at them gratefully, because he knew they were the new country's only hope. As the British redcoats climbed from their ships, most of their horses had died during the journey, and began marching towards Philadelphia, Washington knew that the time had come to fight. In two terrible battles at Brandywine and Germantown, just outside Philadelphia, Washington tried but failed to protect the rebel capital. Our army was broken, an American soldier wrote in his diary. The roads to Philadelphia were now wide open to the British. The rebel capital had fallen. American soldiers rode into Philadelphia to warn rebel leaders to get out fast. In the middle of the night, they knocked on doors to wake up the leaders of Congress. The British are coming! Save yourselves! They shouted. Everyone managed to escape before the Redcoats marched in on September 26th to the music of God Save the King through the same streets that Washington's army had just marched through. It was a great moment for General Howe. In November, Howe stopped fighting for the winter. He and his army made Philadelphia their comfortable winter home. They spent the winter of 1777 to 1778 enjoying Philadelphia. There were wonderful dinners, dances, and fashionable parties amongst the loyalists there. Washington's soldiers felt terrible about losing Philadelphia. But as they marched away from their capital, they did not yet know that there was some good news. In northern New York, at a place called Saratoga, another part of the American army 
had just won an important battle. When the news of the American victory at Saratoga reached Europe, it surprised everyone. The broken American army still had some life in it. The British were unhappy, of course. But the French, who had secretly sent weapons to the American army before the battle, celebrated in their streets as if it had been a victory of their own. Washington now needed a place for his soldiers to spend the winter. He wanted to be close to Philadelphia, but far enough away not to be surprised by the British. He found Valley Forge on a hill near the Schuylkill River, about 32 kilometers outside Philadelphia, and ordered his army to begin marching there. During the march, Washington's army became tired and ill. Some of the soldiers were again shoeless. You can follow our army, Washington wrote to Congress, by the blood of their feet. A young doctor with the American army describes the week-long December march to Valley Forge this way. We are ordered to march over the river. It's snowing. I'm sick and can eat nothing. Cold and uncomfortable. Poor food. Here comes a bowl of soup full of burnt leaves. Joseph Martin's diary also describes the miserable arrival. We arrived at Valley Forge in the evening. It was dark and there was no water. I was dying of thirst. There was nothing in Valley Forge for the 10,000 soldiers but snowy fields, an icy river, and the wind. The next morning, Washington ordered his men to begin building houses using trees from the neighboring forests. All the 1,000 small houses built by the soldiers were exactly the same. Each had a door in one corner and a chimney in the other, with 12 men to a house. In the beginning, life was difficult but bearable for the rebel soldiers. But soon, with the arrival of the heavy winter snows, life became almost impossible. Water ran down through the wooden roofs of the little houses and made the floors into a sea of mud. Thick smoke from the chimneys filled the rooms, and cold air blew in through holes in the walls. Washington lived with his wife Martha in a nearby farmhouse, but his life was not much more comfortable. Supplies no longer arrived. The men didn't have enough blankets, clothes, or shoes. Some days, the men had nothing to eat. On other days, they made fire cakes from flour and water and cooked them over their fires. When they had no more flour, the hungry soldiers had to go into the forest to find nuts and small animals to eat. A new song was sung in the camp. No meat, no coat, no flour, no soldier. With a heavy heart, Washington wrote to the American Congress at their new meeting place in the town of York, begging them to help. We need food and clothes. Please send supplies. My men are not made of stone, he wrote. He complained that his soldiers were sleeping under snow, without clothes or blankets, while the leaders of Congress were warm in their beds. But Congress was too weak or too slow to do anything. The most terrible thing about Valley Forge was that the soldiers did not have to go hungry. America had plenty of food. A large part of the problem was Congress, which was unable to manage its war and made many mistakes. Sometimes, for example, there was a lot of food in a town not far away, but the new government couldn't find wagons to carry it to Washington's camp. Farmers around Valley Forge didn't help. They had enough food to save the American soldiers, but they chose instead to trade with the British, who could pay higher prices.
In March 1778, snowstorms hit Washington's camp, one after the other. Disease went through the camp like an icy wind. By spring, one in four men at Valley Forge had died. Thousands had run away. Some soldiers just went home, but others joined the British Army in Philadelphia. In the end, after six months in camp, only about 3,000 men were left. But surprisingly, something good happened at Valley Forge. The men who survived the miserable winter had become much better fighters. Several Europeans who agreed with the American idea of independence had arrived in the camp to help teach the soldiers. One young French officer, the Marquis de Lafayette, had come on his own, determined to fight for liberty. He became like a son to Washington at Valley Forge. But it was largely because of an officer from Germany, Baron von Steuben, that the rebels learned to march, fire a gun, and follow orders. Von Steuben, a man with an easy smile, was determined to bring order to the dirty camp. Even rags can be clean, he told the men. He made them into fine soldiers. The army that came out of Valley Forge was smaller, but it was stronger and more united than before. Also that spring, Americans got some great news from France. The French king, Louis XVI, pleased with the American victory at Saratoga, had decided to enter the war on the American side against Britain, the old enemy of France. This changed everything. The French began to send warships, lots of money, and their best soldiers to join Washington's men. Although the war continued for several more years, the help from France saved the American Revolution and, in the end, brought victory. Chapter 9 The Long War Comes to an End when George Washington and his men heard that France was joining the war, they started to celebrate. Cannonballs were shot into the sky as Washington rode up and down in front of his soldiers. Long live the King of France! They shouted. More cannons were fired. Long live General Washington! The men cried. And they threw their hats up into the air. Washington and his army, like all Americans, were hopeful now of a quick end to the war. The British were worried by the news that France had entered the war. French ships were on their way to the colonies. The British decided to leave Philadelphia because the French could trap them there. As the Redcoats marched to New York City, Washington moved his army north of the city to watch the British closely. By this time, many men in the British Parliament wanted an end to the war. But King George was not ready to lose the colonies. The king knew that he needed a new war plan. The old one was not working at all. What did the British have to show for their many years at war? Although they controlled important harbor cities in America and had won many battles, they were not winning the war. Every time they tried to destroy Washington's army, Washington escaped. It was difficult to get control over the northern colonies. So King George decided to send a big army down to the southern colonies. Surely we will have victory there, he argued. After all, the South is home to many American colonists who are loyal to me. These loyalists will join our army, and then together we'll move north to take Washington and his men. So the Redcoats went south. At first, 
they had an easy time, as the king had said. In 1779, under General Cornwallis, the commander-in-chief of the Southern Army, the British easily won the state of Georgia. In May 1780, they took Charleston in South Carolina, and with it, 5,000 American prisoners. For the Americans, it was the worst battle of the war. America is losing the war, cried a leader of the British Parliament. Soon, all of South Carolina was in British hands. Up north, Washington was very interested in the news from the South, and he grew more and more worried at what he heard. It was a hard time for him and his men in the North, too. Although history has made the terrible winter at Valley Forge famous, the winter of 1779-80 to was even worse for Washington and his men. There was not much fighting, but there were endless snowstorms, with unbearably cold, strong winds. The men never had a chance to build houses, so they slept in tents. The heavy snow often made the tents fall down on top of the sleeping soldiers. Young Joseph Martin was still with Washington's army. It was cold enough to cut a man in two, he wrote in his diary. Martin was often hungry, and his friends once cooked their shoes over an open fire and ate them for dinner. Again, Washington begged Congress to send supplies. Things have never been so bad, he warned them. I have almost stopped hoping. Congress, weaker and poorer than before, was unable to do much. American citizens didn't seem to worry that their army was hungry. In the end, Washington took the supplies that he needed from surrounding farms. Although he could not pay the farmers, he always wrote down everything that he took and promised to pay the farmers when the war was finished. The British were still moving through the South, and they won battle after battle. The war was destroying the South. Many American loyalists had joined the British side, while many American rebels, farmers and mountain men among them, had joined the American side. There was bloody fighting between friends and neighbors. Brother fought brother, often to the death. As General Cornwallis moved his army through the hot, wet swamps of the South towards North Carolina, things got more difficult for him. Although this was the middle of Loyalist country, small groups of rebel Americans began surprise attacks on his soldiers. One leader of these attacks was Francis Marion, a small man called the Swamp Fox. His men came out of the swamps, hid behind rocks and trees, and shot at the redcoats, killing them one by one. Sometimes they took prisoners and horses. Then they disappeared back into the swamps, where the British could not follow. These sudden violent attacks which they had learned from American Indians, frightened Cornwallis's men. The Redcoats fought very well in big battles in open fields, but they were not ready for the surprise attacks of the Swamp Fox. Then, on March 15, 1781, the Americans and British fought a big battle at Guilford Courthouse in North Carolina, one quarter of Cornwallis's army was destroyed. Cornwallis moved on to Virginia that spring. In early August, tired of marching and fighting, Cornwallis decided to rest at Yorktown in Virginia with his army of 8,000 men. The men began building a fort around the town. Cornwallis had made a bad mistake. Yorktown was on a peninsula in the Atlantic Ocean. This was not a good resting place, because Cornwallis had his back to the water. If the Americans attacked by land, it was difficult to escape. 
Cornwallis understood this problem, but thought that he could escape by sea. British ships will soon sail down from New York to help us, Cornwallis thought. But in fact, those ships never came. At the same time, up north, Washington was growing desperate. France was desperate, too. She had spent millions of dollars in America and had no money left. Tired and worried, Washington sat down at his camp north of New York City with General Rochambeau, the commander-in-chief of the French army in America. The two desperate men knew that Cornwallis was in Yorktown, and they made a plan. Let's march our two armies down south to Yorktown, Rochambeau said. If we bring our French ships up from the Caribbean at the same time, we can surround Cornwallis at Yorktown and trap him there. It was a wonderful plan, but a dangerous one. Washington and Rochambeau had to move their soldiers down to Yorktown in great secret. The British Army in New York must not find out where they were moving. It was the time for violent autumn storms to begin, and the French ships were in danger of being caught in storms at sea. Washington, usually so strong, was very worried. Was he taking his army to its death? As the French and American soldiers marched down to Yorktown, the French ships sailed up to Yorktown. They were very lucky. The soldiers and the ships arrived in Yorktown at almost the same time. They had trapped General Cornwallis. Washington, usually as serious and as calm as a statue, began jumping up and down like a child. No one had ever seen him so happy. Yorktown was now surrounded on all sides. On October 9th, 1781, the French and Americans began firing their big guns. They shot 3,600 cannonballs into Yorktown that day. The British fired back. After five years, the soldier Joseph Martin was still with Washington's army, and he was still writing in his diary. A man at my side got a ball in his head, he writes, and fell under my feet, crying out. All day and all night, for more than a week, the French and American cannons continued to shoot as the armies moved closer and closer to the British fort. Many British soldiers were wounded, and no one inside the fort was getting enough to eat. Finally, on the morning of October 17, 1781, through the thick white smoke and the angry noise of the big guns, the Americans heard the small sound of a drum. It was coming from a little red-coated drummer boy, standing on top of a wall. Then a British soldier stood up and waved a white flag. The boy beat louder and louder on his drum. A sudden silence fell as every gun stopped shooting. Cornwallis had surrendered. Washington's dream had come true. It was the beginning of the end. Two days later, French and American soldiers stood in two long lines, each about 1.5 kilometers long. The French soldiers, in their handsome uniforms, were standing on the left side of the road. The American soldiers, many in dirty clothes and barefoot, stood on the right. General Washington was on his horse at the head of the American line. General Rochambeau was at the foot of the French line. The British soldiers marched out of the fort. Some were crying. One by one, they threw down their guns. Then the men, now prisoners of war, marched slowly down the road between the two lines of French and American soldiers. It was a painful moment for the Redcoats. They kept their eyes on the French 
and were unable to look into the eyes of the American enemy. These men had fought long and hard, and now they were angry and ashamed of surrendering to Washington's second-class army. Some history books report that as the Redcoats surrendered, a British band played The World's Turned Upside Down, and indeed, things had changed. Mother England, the strongest and richest country in the world, was surrendering to its children. Oh, God, it is all over, cried the British Prime Minister when the news finally reached London a month later. Although a peace agreement was not signed until 1783, the Yorktown battle ended the long American Revolution. Chapter 10. An Independent Country The news of the Yorktown battle hit Britain hard. British citizens were tired of the endless war and its high costs. In December 1781, the British Parliament voted to make peace with America. King George seemed to be the only Englishman against the peace. He angrily refused to sign the agreement. But in the end, he had to agree. Neither the British Army nor the British Parliament wanted to go on fighting. Anyone who continues to fight against America is an enemy of the King of England, said Parliament in February 1782. At least 9,000 soldiers from both sides had died in battle and about 12,000 had been wounded. A much higher number had died of hunger, cold, and disease. With the fighting at an end, Benjamin Franklin, like most Americans, celebrated. There was never a good war or a bad peace, Franklin said. And his famous words are still repeated today. Americans danced in the streets cooked oxen, and exploded fireworks in the sky. Washington had become an American hero. I am not surprised at what George has done, Washington's mother quietly told the visiting French General Lafayette, for he was always a good boy. British and American leaders arrived at the peace table in Paris to discuss a number of questions. One of the most difficult was, what will happen to the Loyalists? A hundred thousand Loyalists had left America after the war, escaping to Canada or Britain. Rebels had taken their land and homes. At the meeting in Paris, the British asked the Americans to accept the Loyalists back and to return their land. But the Americans made no promises. So most Loyalists stayed outside America for the rest of their lives. The final peace agreement was signed on September 3, 1783, and a new country, the United States of America, was born. Washington had kept his army together since the Yorktown victory. But once the peace agreement was signed, he surrendered his sword to Congress and said goodbye to his men. Washington's soldiers cried when he left. It was unbearable for them to say goodbye to this man who had been as strong as a rock for them. The soldier Joseph Martin had stayed with Washington's army until the very end. We have lived as a family of brothers for many years, he writes sadly in his diary, and now we must leave each other. Forever. Although the people of the United States were happy to win the war, they realized that there were many difficulties in their future. There are two parts to a revolution. First, you must break down the old way of life. And after that, you must build up a new way of life. Americans were no longer governed by Britain. 
but they had no clear road to follow for a new American way of life. Money was a big problem. The government had none and it was not even able to pay the soldiers who had fought in the war. Washington's soldiers were angry and ready to explode. Many had not been paid for years. They had left their families and fought hard for years, and now they were still hungry and miserable. Baron von Steuben, who worked so hard at Valley Forge, had to wait until eight years after the war was over to be paid. For the first time in America, there were homeless people in the streets, and many of them were soldiers. Washington felt bad for his men. In March 1783, he met some of his angry soldiers who were planning to overthrow the weak new government. He asked them to control themselves and to be patient, and he promised to do his best to get them their money. The men just stared at him. They were unmoved. Then Washington remembered that he had a letter to read to them. As he pulled it out of his pocket, he seemed unable to see the words. I'm sorry, he told his officers as he put on his glasses. I have already grown gray helping my country, and now I am going blind. These simple words touched the officers' hearts. They got up quietly and went home. Once again, Washington had saved the revolution. During the war, Congress had borrowed a lot of money, mostly from France, Spain, and Holland. But now the people in the 13 states didn't pay their taxes. So there was no way for the United States to pay this money back. Congress was not strong enough to make the states work together. Each state was making its own coins and bills, and no one was sure how much this money was worth. If you asked an American what country he was from, the answer was usually the name of a state, not the United States of America. People realized that the states were joined together in some way, but America still didn't feel like a country. During the war, the states had pulled closely together. But afterwards, people began to say that the states were held together only by a thread. In the state of Massachusetts, 1,000 angry farmers who were losing their farms because they could get no government help, marched together and tried to steal weapons from a government building. When Massachusetts asked Congress for help, there was nothing that Congress could do. This violent action worried many people. Will America survive? they wondered. The new country was being destroyed from within. After his long years at war, George Washington had ridden his horse home to the farm that he loved in Virginia, where he was looking forward to a quiet life with his wife Martha. I will rest under my own fig tree, he wrote. But it was not to be. These were troubled times. Washington was needed in Congress as leader of a three-month meeting. Congress had realized that the United States could not just be a friendly group of independent states. The country needed a stronger government and a constitution. So Washington and some representatives from the states met in Philadelphia in May 1787 to write a constitution for a new kind of government, a government for free people, of the people by the people, and for the people. At 81, Benjamin Franklin was the oldest representative at the meeting. His thinking was clear, but his body was broken. He was carried into the meeting every day in an armchair that he had brought all the way from Paris. All 13 states voted for the new Constitution and then signed it 
Benjamin Franklin cried as he signed his name. The Constitution wasn't perfect, he said, but it was very good. American citizens read it carefully, line by line, the day that it came out in the newspaper. Everyone had a different opinion about it, of course. The Constitution separated the government into three parts. Each part, it said, should watch over the other two. That way, no part of the government could become too strong. It was a people's government. In the Bill of Rights, ordinary citizens were given rights that citizens in other parts of the world had never had before. American citizens were now free, for example, to say anything that they thought or to put their opinions in the newspaper. They had the right to speak out as a group and to disagree with the government. The new government was governed by laws, not by a king. But some big mistakes were made in the Constitution. It did not free the many slaves in America, and it did not give any rights to American Indians. It took many years before these groups had the right to vote. The Constitution called for the people to vote for a president to be the leader of the country. No one was surprised that the states voted for George Washington as the first president. But Washington didn't really want the job. I'm already 56 years old, he said. My father and all my brothers died before the age of 50. If I die while I'm president, it will be bad for our country. Washington worried about other things, too. If I'm a bad president, he asked his friends, will Americans forget what I did in the war? He often said that the most important thing for him was the good opinion of good people. But he was finally persuaded to take the job, and in 1789, he became the first president of the United States. John Adams became his vice president. Thomas Jefferson, the writer of the Declaration of Independence, became his secretary of state. And Henry Knox, the bookseller who brought the cannons to Boston, was his secretary of war. And Washington did not fail as president. He was bright and honest, calm and fair. In fact, he is still known to grateful Americans today as the father of his country.